the Bellfield Community Foundation for the TOS program, which stands for Transportation of Bellfield Seniors. Item G is authorization for the Southfield Fire Department to apply for a FEMA grant in the amount of $35,520 with a 20% city matching requirement of $8,880 to be provided from the Equipment Revolving Fund to purchase 60 replacement structural firefighting helmets, 6 replacement treadmills, and the addition of 5 new elliptical training machines. Item H is appointment of Frederick Thorne, Jr., Deputy City Administrator, and Lee Schultz, Assistant City Engineer, as the City's representative and alternate to the Southeastern Oakland County Water Authority. Item I is a year-end budget adjustment for financial reporting purposes to transfer funding for property tax appeals outstanding that may be chargeable to the 2011-2012 fiscal year. This request was reviewed at the June 11, 2012 Committee of the Whole Meeting. Item J is a year-end budget adjustment to transfer $59,831 from the emergency cleanup fund balance to the 2011-2012 public works budget for expenses incurred during the emergency cleanup effort in the city's neighborhood to recover from the severe storm of May 28, 2012. Item K is a request for continuation of the existing contracts for the city of Southfield to provide fire department services and police and fire dispatch services to the city of Lake Village in the upcoming fiscal year, July 1, 2012 to June 30, 2013, at the current annual fee of $573,242 for fire department services and $51,431 for police and fire dispatch services. Both the fire department and the police department have reported a high level of satisfaction with the long-standing working relationship between our personnel and the personnel of the city of Lakewood Village. Madam Chair, Mr. I'd like to move the consent judgment of the committee A through K. Motion by Mr. Capacity, supported by Ms. Jordan. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion has carried. Madam President, I just want to make a note. I'm um, you know, very proud of, of the way that we've been able to handle our budget here in the city. But items A through D, um, dealing with the library, I just want to give acknowledgement to the library. Like city librarians here at the APUX, the library board, everything that, that they've uh, requested our approval on in their budget is a reduction from last year, as high as a 59% reduction um, compared to last year. Uh, so I do want to give acknowledgement to the library board and our city librarian and staff over there for also uh, doing more with less and, and presenting us uh, the ability to approve of some decreases in spending from last year. Well, I I'm um, just going to add, on um, the same token, we have the uh, grant uh, from the Southwood Community Foundation that uh, is putting um, our uh, uh, community giving uh, to um, some very worthwhile uh, projects that emergency relief fund, and then, of course, the uh, FEMA grant for our fire department. Um, these are some of the reasons I think that. Um, we continue to um, make ends meet because we're we're looking for uh, grants as well as um, uh, doing those, those kind of connections uh, that are important for uh, keeping it together in these tough times. Thank you, Mr. I was just going to say I think some of you have some tough negotiating. Congratulations on that. Next, we come to public hearings. We have uh, three public hearings. Um, we have 15 to 12, uh, Mr. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. Our first public hearing, DR 1312, is a rezoning request of the San Morano to rezone 0.20 acres of RA single family residential property to P vehicular parking. The property is located at 19760 Baldwin Street. Um, Mr. Um, Moran is here to make a couple of brief comments before you open the public hearing. The Samurai 7367 Raptor Lane was conclusion. Um, thank you, Council President, um, members of the Council, Mr. Lawrence, um, for giving me the opportunity to speak on how important this rezoning is for office building and Evergreen itself. 
chair, and I have a brief video. Okay. back 
And I can tell you that he's also been uh, very selective in regards to the tenants that he has allowed or not allowed in that site, uh, contrary to the challenges that he has had in regards to renting out the space. Um, being a property owner at Evergreen, I know those challenges myself, and, and I applaud him for, for being selective and waiting for the right opportunity to come along so that he could actually put a, a desirable tenant in the space and, and uh, something that we'd be proud of to showcase on Evergreen Road. Um, a few of the other things that uh, I wanted to mention is that uh, his proposal is in line uh, with the master plan, uh, as stated in the video. It's also in line with our current zonings as well as uh, some of the other things we've done uh, to the east of Evergreen Road. And it's in line with uh, not only current but future develop future development plans as well. Um, I think he should be uh, allowed to rezone the parking or the, or the parcel to parking, so that we can continue towards our steps of developing a vibrant city center. And I think this is one of those small steps and something that uh, I think he should be approved. Thank you. Yeah. 
justice to the homes that are being left there because, I don't know, is that one uh, home to be left there? Is that the one that's at uh, 19760 Golden? Uh, Golden, Golden? Is that for the gym? Yeah. yeah. The, min the minimum depth that we found to make it practical for redevelopment is about 200 feet, which includes most of the commercial frontage and about one residential lot depth. And I, I agree with you that that is not consistently even up and down. Most of those residential lots um, have been purchased by adjacent commercial landowners. And in the long term, um, they, they more, more likely would be rezoned. Um, in the near future, long term future, I agree with you about putting more depth on the evergreen to protect the residents. This is just a rezoning. Um, to vehicular parking, which also provides an extra buffer because no commercial development can happen immediately adjacent to the residence. And a masonry wall will be required at time of site plan review. And the applicant has decided to uh, chosen the path of getting the rezoning first, and then we'll come back for site plan review. And we'll have some time to work out some of your legitimate concerns. Yeah, but I don't know how, how you're going to uh, make it look right. Well, with regard to where the, the wall south is, we, we're, when it comes back to the site plan, we're going to require additional landscape screening on the south side of the parking lot so that the residents doesn't look right into a parking lot and the wall itself. And, and until that, that parcel gets redeveloped for future parking. Yeah, the organization between the residential and the commercial, you would think would have lots that line up all the way north and south. So again, a natural break and a buffer, and it can look like it belongs this way. You're, you're actually taking uh, the value away from the home that is on open because cause now that person is staring across the street at a concrete pouring wall, and then to the side of them, you would have another wall that is not even going to be even with it. Right, and, and, and I don't agree, agree with that, that observation. I mean, I, I don't think it's good planning at all. I just think that, you know, we're, I think we're really ruining this, if you call it strip commercial, you know, that it has, it should be designated so many feet, don't do commercial, have you had a good parking, don't start zigzagging and get through Evergreen and making it be a negative to the residents of the Matter of fact, when I go by there today, I was surprised that how well the homes are kept and, and uh, some of the homes are uh, adding to them and fixing them up and there must be new owners in there. Uh, I, I think part of the, is that this is detailed because it's a private owner requesting a rezoning as opposed to the city maybe looking at rezoning the entire corridor. I believe the intention of the, that parcel immediately south of the parking lot, which is viewing this, is to be rezoned to vehicular parking when the former bank site is redeveloped. And I believe that's uh, under under either an ownership or an option by the adjacent property owner. So I, I, I see this as a, a, a trend that's going to continue southward to where the, the Jimmy Johns and the Bob, they did yeah, a similar Yeah, thing. I understand, but you have to have a plan. And, and by that I mean that, you know, uh, mm -hmm. these people drive into their residence uh, on the River Green Road. And we did nothing to give them what normally a subdivision has as a nice entranceway that, that creates a, a residential look in what is behind them. And, and so you're just going through uh, making turns, no left turns, signage, and all this stuff going on along. They're trying to direct traffic and commercial. <coughs> And, and the way you go into that neighborhood is got to go through this particular streets over in, in Fillmore. And, and you know, I mean, I put myself in that position. If I did it, I, I don't mind the commercial if it looks decent and well landscaped. And, and maybe the, the north and south sides of the development has landscaping that could, you know, add to the residential look of, of uh, their entranceway. And uh, hopefully we'll look at that. Right. But I, 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 I did to see a staggered wall. We did that a 
telegraph road that turned out to be uh, something to dread. And uh, nobody knows where the, the industrial starts and stops. You go down and all over. Mr. Brooker knows. And and, uh, and here we are doing it right now here just in, inside the city hall. And I just don't think that's a very attractive. Uh, I, I do need, I, I'm not a post like you said, and maybe we need parking, but maybe we can enhance it some way when the site plan comes in. I agree. And on both sides of the of the street, as you go into that neighborhood, you have some kind of landscaping that would not be as harsh or we want to do residential. Because the other way, you go down the river, you come out by the liquor store, you know, which is not kept very well. Right. And across the end, you got a nice landscape golf course. But, but uh, you know, so if you live in that first block, you really don't have a real nice entrance where you found it going into your subdivision. I, I, I can tell the council we did not have any public attend our workshops or the public hearing of objects to this. Well, I don't really care about anybody coming and objecting here because I want to try to keep the city as nice as I can. The residents may not want to come out for whatever reason, but it's not going to change my mind whether I'm going to go against it. Yeah, I know that. I would admit it. Okay, there. Mr. Uh, a couple things. Was any, uh, I guess it's to um, Mr. Crow, uh, was any thought given to um, removing a parking space or two in the north existing lot and doing a driveway down? so that there would be no egress to Golden Street? The, um, in other words, doing doing a drive behind the, the, the building and accessing and parking that way? The, the conceptual plan shows um, exactly what you're stating. There would be a connection to the parking lot from north to south. There would just be one way out southbound with the right hand turn only. Oh, all right. In concept, that's what it was discussed. So that there there would be a, a couple lots removed, parking spaces removed, the driver would come down the rear of the building, connect to the parking lot, and then southbound in the right turn. Uh, uh, and 
in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mr. Chairman? I support, however, I agree with the Councilman for Cassidy in terms of the entrance into the neighborhood and making sure we have the correct balance of the density supporting the building, but also keeping in consideration the residents that have to drive there every day to their homes. I agree, ma'am. And I assure you it will be easy. Can you Yes, I just, just to follow up, he will require now to come back before council for site plan approval. Now that the rezoning has been granted. Madam Chair. Just to emphasize this point, there is a, clearly a need uh, for the council to direct the city planner to give a comprehensive review of the retail along everything. The staggering of the road, there are some of those homes that are owned by the business owner that the plan is to demolish. And it seems very clear that there's a need for a comprehensive presentation so that we're not looking at these single hand because I know that uh, some of the other homes have already been purchased and the business owners are holding them for uh, that. And also for the council to look at what is your plan? What do you want um, for it to look like? And so that the, the planner and the city were all on the same page. So I would, I would ask the council to consider bringing this forward. It's not just a single development, but to bring all those property owners together, find out how many of those homes are already purchased. And then the council can really have input on what do you want to, you know, like common, common dividers from this point on going across that, that, um, that would um, divide the commercial from the residential. And one of our residents, Michelle, brought up a, a good point. Do we have a standard with burning, with, with um, wood, with brick walls? What do we want uh, to be consistent? Because you can have another property on that comes and do something different. So I think if, we, if the council has a clear instruction and expectation and plan, it will make this development. It's, it's a wonderful, um, Evergreen is really shaping up, and I'm very proud of it. But we do have to say now, like you said, um, Council President, that our residents have to be part of this growth and development. And I, I think it would be very, it would be, it would be good for the city, good for the residents. If you want to bring the residents in and say, you know, this is what, what's going on here, <coughs> this is what we're going to do, then everyone's on the same page. I, the, the one thing that bothers me the most about the city of South Arizona, every development we have, we're putting it next to an existing use. Mm -hmm. And it, they're very difficult, they're not easy. So the more that we can get some comprehensive and, and really um, not visionary, but comprehensive strategic plan, it's going to make uh, all of our lives uh, you know, I would add to that that we go around the corner on 10 miles from the fire property to Evergreen. Uh, add that as well as if we, if we take a bigger look at, the, at that whole area. Um, you know, a couple of those properties on 10 Mile, um, you have Jeffrey Figer's complex, which is beautifully landscaped, very attractive. And then you've got some dated uh, buildings there, and, and this is all part of our, our city center. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be um, behoove us to include some of those parcels on 10 Mile. Uh, the gas station, for instance, is uh, way too small um, for what it is. Um, built in a day when there wasn't as much traffic at that corner. We, we can uh, certainly do that at future meetings and take a zero on the park. We've done that in the past. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. You've been approved, so Thank we will we'll go to the next uh, uh, step, which will be site plan, and then we can work on some of the details. Thank you, Dennis, for the time. Thank you. Next. Uh, Before we go on, yeah. we've got to introduce our. You're right. You understand? It's a 15-8 Madam Chair, I move that we introduce artist number 1595. Good boy. Um, motion by Mr. Gracious, 
property in the backyard, it wouldn't, I wouldn't see a problem with it. I have a uh, neighbor across from me that has a tent, and she has like hostas around it, so it's, you know, it's not a problem for me. So, I for her, I know she's a jewel to the neighborhood, I know her personally as well. And she's, these children, she's the asset to the community. I really believe that these children that are under her, they'll come out better human beings. And me personally, I'm a better person because of her too. Sorry, I'm a little nervous, but she's a really good person and she stands for what's right, so I'm for her and her job. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't want to listen to me. Seeing none, I declare the public hearing closed. Council? Madam yeah, Chair, sure. yeah, I have a. Mr. Cassidy. Uh, the, um, the ordinance that we approved, and I don't have it in front of me, but I thought it was going to be more restrictive and protecting residential uh, than to allow more group homes and child care into the uh, residential areas. Uh, this particular, I went by this, uh, this home and looked at it, and it is in nice condition, it's well maintained, although there's no landscaping. Uh, but you know, I just, uh, this is R4, which is uh, one of our better residential zones. And, you know, in Kevin Village has always been a strong subdivision. I think there are 11 or 12 subdivisions in one there. And I just, uh, I just don't think that, that we have to have this uh, in a residential neighborhood. Uh, you know, looking at the city, and uh, we have some what, 800, 600 vacant homes in the city, and the size of the homes and uh, the values uh, diminishing is open the doors to other than residential living. And, uh, and I am really not for for during this economic times to change uh, the way, the manner that the residential neighbors have been in the past. They all their neighbors have always been strong. I think the two values drop any more than they have. I really do believe that when you introduce group home and child care into a neighborhood, it doesn't reduce the values. Uh, so I, I just, uh, I think that you're, you know, not taking away from the, what you do and, and the service that you give to these people who need child care. But uh, I just think I have to sit here and, and respect also people who live and maintain their residential homes and they want a quiet, peaceful place to, to reside. Uh, and I just uh, went and looked at this and looked at the nice homes in that area and I just think that uh, we are getting so inundated anymore with these uses that uh, I just cannot be for it. Uh, there may be other places in the city that uh, that you could have a child care. And we've got one right here that's going to be moved for a commercial right down the street from us today. And and uh, so there are facilities on the main streets that can house children and can care for them. But I just don't believe that they have to close <coughs> those that kinds of uses in the residential, especially the strong residential areas. And um, boy, I, uh, I see this income uh, up and uh, I read it and read it and went over and looked at your home and everything you're saying, it's kept nice, but I just think that, you know, it is kept that way now and you are in charge of it but when does it change to a child care or group home it stays that way and the people who can move move and, uh, and then I see a deterioration it's not just uh, something I've dreamt up, it's happening all over the city and then the independence is the 
other day and we had two neighbors who were moving away because they had a group home going next door to them and they came home. And, uh, and I guess they're trying to get some kind of, of uh, <coughs> stabilization of uses in their neighborhoods uh, and protect the values that have been there. And uh, you, know, you see on the screen that the residential homes are dropping off almost 40% of value. And, uh, and we have to do something to maintain the integrity of them and try to make them uh, get strong. It's uh, vital to the community. And um, so I just cannot afford this. Um, I have a question to Ms. Alexander. Um, I, I know in the uh, material we were provided that it, it says um, you could not have people or children being dropped off um, between um, 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. What are your hours of operation currently and what are your proposed hours? Um, the current hours are 6 30 a.m. and 6 p.m. Okay, and proposed? The same hours. The same hours. Uh, and is this a Monday through Friday? Correct. Okay. And um, how many people will you, how many people are, um, it's yourself and uh, how many people are in the business? Currently I have one employee. One employee and you'll have? I'm looking for right now. You'll have two with a man 12, a few yeah. had 12 children. Yes. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for answering that. Then I have a question for um, Tom and Mr. Grove. Um, I would agree with uh, Councilman Mercasi about businesses and, and neighborhoods. Um, however, we have lots of child care across the city uh, in neighborhoods. We also have people that um, use their home as their office. Um, so, um, I, my question would be uh, to you is how, uh, yeah, where, where's the line drawn here? Between um, this this uh, case before us and uh, are we all, you know are, where are we subjecting neighborhoods to? Okay, that's a good question. And this is part of what we discussed when we were considering this. Prior to establishing this, there are a lot of unregulated home occupations, and this is considered a home occupation. The state allows by right the family. Um, child care up to six individuals. So right now we have dozens if not more throughout the city. And the, um, the state also allows the city to regulate as a special use the, the group child care home, which is 7 to 12. Again, prior to us putting something on the post, this was already happening. And the state defines both of these as home occupations, not businesses, um, the family, the family, uh, Federal Family Act allows you to, to have five unrelated un, uh, individuals living in your home. So they set the maximum at 12 as residential. Some of these business would be the child care center and daycare centers, which are the ones like the kinder care and so forth that are, are regulated in commercial properties and uh, in commercial, commercially zoned districts. So that's the distinction. So. One to six is permitted by right residential. Seven to twelve can be regulated as we are doing as a special use reporting public hearing. And we at least have some control over that should the council desire to move forward on that. And then anything larger than that would be regulated as a business, as a child care center or daycare center is defined by the state. And those are the commercial types of businesses. Okay. Um, on the issue of the fences, uh, I don't know the, uh, I, I, I know Cranbrook well, uh, and I know there are multiple subdivisions in that square mile, so I don't know uh, with precision um, Cranbrook 2, um, and I appreciate your bringing the bylaws, um, but I, I see fences in Cranbrook. Well, as, as a matter of fact, I mean, if they're already existing, you can't, they're pre-existing. You can't say um, to somebody else, well, uh, you know, all of a sudden the bylaws take effect when you already have them. I mean, that, that door has been open. Right. If, if I could, um, because this was an issue that was raised during the public hearing. Um, we require the fence to protect the children, keep the bad guys out, and the kids in. The state requires the fence. The state is the state. Yeah. It's part
But we, we also put that in our regulations. Um, the, the issue with the bylaws was brought up about no fencing, and we, uh, we asked for a copy of the bylaws. We didn't have one that was produced that was recorded, but it did, it did say that fences up to 36 inches were permitted. But we did do an inventory with the Cranbrook Village itself, number two, and we identified 14 properties with fences, five of which were six feet high, seven of which were four feet high, one of which was three feet high, and one was undetermined because it was around the pool in the backyard. And again, we can only um, either approve or deny based on our standards. The association could take up this matter privately, but there is a history of allowing fences because, and I, and I do have a map of the location for those fences. Um, around the corner from me, I have a uh, daycare that um, I've known a lady for years, well operated. Um, she has up to 12 children, uh, she's been there for a long time. And what I observe are um, the cars don't stay long. You know, the parents have to walk the children to the door, they drop the children off, they pick them up. Um, it, it, I don't find, personally, I don't find it a nuisance. Uh, I don't live next door to it either, but I, I see the, the cars come and go all the time. And um, uh, I also, uh, while I'm not an expert on child care, uh, I do know a fair amount about the regulations uh, through my uh, career experience. And um, uh, you uh, have to, uh, there are all kinds of requirements that the for the licensing, for the, for the state licensing, and um, uh, a fence is, is required, uh, as well as um, the, um, uh, the the ratio of adults to children, and, and it varies depending on, on the uh, age look that you're carrying. Um, but all, and I also know that there is a scarcity, uh, or it's hard to find um, baby care, uh, infant care. Um, there are a lot of daycares, but they don't all do uh, six weeks to um, you know, 18 months, two years, um, and, and so there is a need for this. Um, it's just an observation uh, that I would make on that point. Uh, thank you.
could find a job but also needed child care, this would, and if we said, no, I'm sorry, we're not going to approve this, and the, the person couldn't take the job because they couldn't find, find child care, and that just doesn't make any sense. I think part of our responsibility is to do, is to walk a, a tightrope and keep a balance on what's best for the residents, what's best for the community. And uh, I think, well, I live in a neighborhood that has group homes. They're not child care. They're, they're group homes, and they aren't, they aren't a, a real problem. Uh, you know, the people are there, they're out, they walk the street. And so, uh, and I know our daughters uh, had child care when their children were small. And it is, you, you drive off, you, you drop your child off, you get back in your car and you leave. So there's a real quick turnover on, on cars uh, parked in front of a, uh, the house in the morning and in the, in the evening. So I don't find that really impressive. And the other question has been answered for me, and that is whether or not six foot fences are allowed in the neighborhood. Obviously they are. And um, I don't see uh, that is uh, a real impediment for me to, to support this this action. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. I, I was going to mention that uh, that this particular home you see on the screen is, is right on a corner, and uh, so it, it is quite visible. And not that it's a bad thing, you know, an individual could have six children like I did it and uh, and uh, you know and it, it doesn't seem to bother the neighbors one way or the other. But you know when you start saying to a neighborhood that it is not a parent with six children, it is now a child care, it's a business. And nobody can deny the fact that if you call something in a home, in child care, it is a business. And if you drive through that area, you'll see that it's almost in the key, where the backyard is, is probably the longest part, and, and the side that faces out of is, is a large part. So most of this yard is, is going to be visible to everyone in the whole area. And, and, uh, and it's not it's not that you're going to see children, you're going to see equipment. There's some equipment there now, uh, next to your neighbor, uh, by your patio. Uh, and that isn't bad either, but what I'm trying to say is that, that when you say something is a child here or a group home, whether you like it or not, it has a designation, and, and if you get the real estate person to go by and, and say, yeah, there's a child care on this corner, but the house cross trees for sale, I guarantee you that somebody will look somewhere else. It's just a matter of what happens. It's real life. And, and I just hate to ever vote against anybody that's struggling and trying to do good in the neighborhood with providing uh, child care to the neighbors, but you know, I mean, I'm looking at the other side. Uh, my job is to, as I see it, is to try to keep stability among our neighborhood because we're surely losing, losing out fast. And uh, one only has to realize this is what last Saturday we got the real estate people rubbing buses to try to get them to sell homes, market the city and the residents, and and uh, and some things are are negative. And I just uh, have to fight for our neighborhoods, and I think by my voting against this project is, is trying to maybe uh, stabilize a little bit of the city. Thank you, Mr. Kelsey. Mr. Jordan? Sure, I have a few questions. Could you tell me exactly how many staff you have presently? Do you have six children now? Yes. And how many staff do you have? I have one. And what are the ages of the children that you have? Um, currently, they are the youngest is six months, <coughs> and the oldest right now uh, will be three. And you're going to move to 12. Correct. And that will require how many 
child to every, uh, one adult to every six children. That's what the ratio is. Okay. My, my experience is that I currently live on the street with a child here that uh, is white and such a okay. And what I've shown, what I've seen is, because it's a quick drop off and a quick pick up, to me there's a disrespect for the, the speed that's in our neighborhood. Because the parents move their cats, they move off their and it's an increase of traffic. And they totally disrespect the, uh, the speed that's required on our street. And that's what I'm afraid of. If you increase it as well, you're going to have more traffic, more quick speed in and out. And that's what I don't like to see. I would not like to see in that, um, in that neighborhood. I agree with Councilman Rakosky in terms of stabilizing our neighborhood. Well, I know you do need to increase, increase would be more revenue to you, but I'm concerned about the entire, not only your neighborhood, but the entire city, by increasing the, um, the numbers from 6 to 12. So that's kind of where I am right now. Because, you know, I can understand that. The thing that has, that was in the meeting, I am very selective with the, the parents that I take. And that doesn't mean that I won't let anyone come. That just means when I say quality care, I get quality care to the children as well as to the parents. They receive a newsletter every month. If they're not in accordance to what my regulations are and what my standards and my goals that I'm trying to stress through the occupation that I have, then I will address it. I, I find it that the, the neighbors that that support me are the ones that did know about the business. And originally when these letters first went out, the neighbors who uh, actually are not opposed for the business never knew I had the business, never knew that there was a daycare there. And again, I have conducted it very well. I make sure that I inform the parents. They're very respectful. I've heard part of the neighbors say that I've never really, I know you have a business, but it seems like you don't, because I don't even hear a door closed there. There's no noise. There's no children yelling. Again, I keep it at a very neighbor, you know, making neighborhood life. Because again, the property, the property that I had, the the house from where it was before to now, I'm not gonna let the property go down. I live there with my two children. I want them to enjoy being in their own home as well. That is our property. We we pay taxes and we want to enjoy it as well. So we want to keep it up just like any other residents. I have been a homeowner for the longest, and I know what it means to keep up your property. I would not let my property go down because I have this occupation in the business, in the home to expand it. So as far as the, and then the traffic, again, if I see anything with my parents, I will address it. That street right there in Rock Creek is already a busy street. Uh, I even think some of the neighbors in the neighborhood just, you know, go fast. So to, to state that the business will increase it, that right now I, I haven't had any complaints, I haven't seen anything, I observe it. And again, I, I, I could be outside just with my children playing. I, I'll see some of the neighbors just go very fast. And so that to me, that's just an individual thing. But as far as my, as far as the occupation of my home with the uh, daycare, I do regulate it and I, I, I do monitor it. So can you give me some assurances that if you um, if you could inform the parents to slow it down. I've never I've never had any problems with the parents coming up if we're outside. I've never saw anyone yet and the neighbors haven't said anything. I haven't seen anyone zoom up or anything like that. I have a lot of Southfield teachers that are are my uh, clients. And again, so they understand that and so I haven't had a, a problem with that. Whether I had a problem with that, everything is always addressed in this way. Everything is repetition, and I go over everything, and I try to tell them I know it's repetition, but I want to make sure it's the case if you get out of line or something happens, that we stay within the goal and make sure that everything is feasible with what I want and the standards that I have with the requirements as a parent and with the child. Thank you. Yeah, I just have a few questions. I was reading over the minutes earlier um, from the planning committee. Uh, has the issue been resolved with what the fence would look like? I know we've, we've talked about whether or not there can or cannot be a fence, but now that we've kind of moved past that, I know that there was an issue with landscaping proposals and, and material. Through the chair, um, one of the issues was about the trying to protect the integrity of the neighborhood. And this fence is located in the rear yard. 
yard, 1,200 square feet, so it's not on the perimeter of the property. However, it is visible in Long Lane. So the Planning Commission made a recommendation as one of their conditions for approval that a landscape hedge should be, be placed adjacent to the fence so that it wouldn't stand out in Long Lane. Um, with regards if the council is desirable, um, we talked about a board on board or some type of double faced, um, nice looking wood fence. As you know, the planning department is under a way of um, developing some fence ordinance regulations and we would incorporate any of those regulations into this particular uh, proposal that the council decides to move forward. Okay. Uh, and I have another question. Um, and it might be some of the concerns we've heard about, uh, you know, quick drop off. How many of your clients actually live in the neighborhood? I think there was one that was here that actually could, you know, was walkable distance. So 80% of So 80% just lives within the, in, in the surrounding houses around you. Yes, and I have um, clients calling me now that uh, are in walking distance that are looking to at least walk their child. Is that where you solicit most of your business kind no, of? No, I don't. Um, I just say they find me. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'll bring a very interesting perspective to this because I have a friend who's actually going to now. She's opening up at an in-home uh, daycare. She's going up to the sixth, and I, I was literally just at her house for the first time yesterday since she made through all the changes. So this could have, you know, fall more timely on my lap. And the reason I bring that up is because I have seen just from the sixth that she she's uh, going towards have six uh, children in her home uh, to open up her business. She has to change kind of the flow of her house quite a bit. There are a lot of rules and a lot of regulations and a lot a lot of restrictions. Down to at her front door, inside her, you know, the kitchen leads out, she has a little pasted exit sign. I mean she has to a T and it has to follow so many rules and regulations. So this isn't just kind of a willy nilly experiment. And I'm sure that you even have to go through further hoops and further regulations to get up to that twelve. Um, in order to make the business successful. So I, I do share in some of the concerns, but I think that they're taken care of um, with all the things and all the adjustments you're going to have to make to your home, even just switching from 6 to 12. Is that correct? Um, actually, when I first uh, came into the residence and I was licensed from my family home, when the state came out, they were very impressed. They actually wanted to use it kind of like a little model, and they asked me, uh, why am I only doing a family home? wonderfully separated stuff and I said I'm in the process process of going through that and they said um, keep us you know let us know what's going on because we actually haven't seen anything like this in a while and the thing about what I'm doing now is that again I'm, I'm quality and I'm going through the necessary steps to actually make make it accredited and what that means with accredited is that there is a lot of stipulations there's a lot of people that come out they stay with me, they observe it. And this is the credit just means that I have the standards, the quality, given the education um, of the children. And so they actually put that still, whether it's six or whether it's 12, that's my goal just to have the, the standards to say, this is what I'm doing. This is not just something that I just wanted to do. I really want to give quality. So I want to, so my whole necessary step is I've gone through with them is just to make it accredited to say, we've been through there, we went under this, we had a magic, you know, had a scope that we have observed this with her. They make notes of that and that's on documentation. So when anyone wants to come and look for that quality care, I have that step. And actually, the state of Michigan is weeding out a lot of these child care. They want their process where they're gonna they're gonna have tears for you and they're gonna come in. The state of Michigan I've been like since two thousand two and they're very strict. And if anything is out of order, they will let you know. They have tears now because they want to weed out the, the daycare that aren't quality. So they're gonna take the necessary steps to see exactly what you're doing, what do you offer and everything like that. So that will be coming in the future they do send us updates regarding that. So within the next couple of years that's what's gonna happen. Yeah, so just from having seen a home from before it was supposed to be accredited until it actually was accredited yesterday, you know, my friend's home, uh, I'm comfortable with, with, I know what you have to go through, um, and I'm especially comfortable that your next door neighbor, um, who's probably going to be affected by it every day, is comfortable with it as well. So I'm, I'm comfortable with making that transition. Yeah. You will? Um, I do have a couple of questions. The uh, agent, the top age of the children is what? Currently, right now, my youngest is six months, and the oldest will be three. And what do you propose to change that? No, I don't. Only under three. No, uh, I I offer six weeks of age through five years of age. Oh, through five.
really struggle with the voice that we have. And I like the fact that you keep your neighbors, your, your parents up here. Because there's one thing to provide a quality child care, it's another thing to provide quality service to the parents and have that expectation. We have to take your words. I don't know how you can mandate it else. If they don't comply, I guess you won't continue to take care of the children. The one thing that I do want to be clear on is the weekend. Because some child care facilities actually do the weekend and the special service will be expanded. How, how do we know that your business will expand to a seven day operation? It was never. I think it was just the fact that who I am because I am a teacher, I'm not, I can't even fathom myself even thinking about seeing a child on the weekend because I have my own family. So it would never get to that point. I've always done Monday to Friday, never have done the weekend or late hours. Again, I have my own children, so I don't want that interfere with them. They have okay. homework, and after that, it's cut off at their time. Okay. I want to ask through the chair. Um, the, if this is approved, is the operating hours part of that approval? Or can it be changed without it coming to the council? For the chair, we have a prohibition on dropping off kids from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. But because it's a special use, um, the council could, could work with the applicant. She stated that her, uh, the, her business runs from 6.30 a.m. to 6 p.m. You could put that as a requirement of the special use approval. I, I um, respect in the, the area and the neighbors um, having a lot of confidence in you from your presentation and other support and child childcare. I think that <coughs> that um, commitment to those hours will be very important for our Thank you. Ms. Seymour, um, Ms. Alexander, um, I would, if this passes, I would like you to consider a wood fence, like a cedar fence, rather than something less obtrusive. Many, most of the homes in your neighborhood are brick. Okay. Uh, I, I know right where you live, um, and, and the homes around the corner and so on. Um, uh, I mean, I have a bias against those bright white, Plastic fences. Um, I mean, aesthetically, um, I would recommend to you that you, you use a, a wooden stockade fence that weathers. Uh, you don't have to, uh, the uh, cedar fencing uh, lasts for years and years and years, and it, it weathers. It looks pretty natural. It blends with lawns and landscaping. Um, I can't make you do that, but I would ask you to consider that. That's fine. I guess what I considered in the very beginning, it was whatever you guys, you all's recommendations were, I was willing to comply. And for the chair, this, it was a pressure treated dog ear shadow box fence panel. I saw that, that, but I heard her say so. I, I know, and that's why I had stated it was yeah. a wood, wood fence too. And I, I only stated during the meeting they had asked me if I would mind changing the wood fencing to vinyl, and I, and I stated that if that's what the recommendations were, that I would comply with it. <laughs> okay. I, I like the wood fencing, and they said they wanted the vinyl. <laughs> <laughs> and with the landscaping, of course. Vinyl? The wood fencing. Who wants the vinyl? One commissioner that recommended. Oh, it sounds like that's uh, the majority wants the wood, it just goes ahead. No, I wanted to be accommodating to the neighborhood. That was my whole thing. Because I am a resident of the neighbor, my whole thing was that if, the, if we didn't like the wood fence thing, I would be more than accommodating to do the vinyl. That's what it was stating. It's just as well as the landscaping as well, too, to, with, the, with the fencing. I was just wanted to be accommodating. Council, we have to decide, first of all, if we want to approve this, and if we do approve it, what conditions we might want to attach to it. Madam Chair. Mr. Frazier. I move that we approve GP 1238, the special user request of Reverend Alexander for a group child care home, with, as presented, with some amendments, which include hours of operation, 6.30 a.m., 6 p.m., Monday through Friday, and that the, uh, Fencing in the backyard be uh, quality wood fence. Motion by Mr. 
recommend landscaping on the bottom? Yes, yes. Well, then let's get The hours are six going to be displayed at 6 30 a.m. to 6 p.m. What is that? Uh, landscaping and judgment, is that correct? Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday, correct. All right, and we have a motion by Mr. Frazier. Mr. Frazier, Mr. Frazier, yes, I will. I'll just bring it up to you. Go ahead, Mr. Frazier. When you mentioned backyard, uh, the backyard doesn't seem to be the problem. We have a whole side yard. You talk about that's along the side yard. That's what faces out of us. Right, through the chair. The it backyard. Was, it was the fence. Yeah, it was something up there. Yeah, it was. It was the fence that faces autumn that was to be landscaped. And the the area that's required to be fenced is only 1,200 square feet, so it's not the entire the entire property. But it would be the one that's visible in Mott Lane that would be required to be screened. That's the side here. That's the side here. <coughs> I'm going to vote for that. All right, that's all right. We had to add that to Mr. Frazier's motion. Uh, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote, Madam Clerk, if you would.
liability not to be owners of the city, so I don't believe that it would be a true. Or? Motion by the city of Kentucky, supported by the city of Kentucky, to approve the estate of Kentucky Sun Clean Energy Resolution and plan. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? No. Four yeses and one no. No one yes. Five yeses. I'm sorry, five yeses. Five yeses and one no and one yes. Okay. 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 Trail. 
telegraph about this one residential lot that's not even up for approval. I'm here to demand that the fence be stopped, but apparently that's legal action I have to take on my own to stop that fence or demand that it be a solid fence that I supported a few minutes ago between commercial and residential. What's the difference? This is commercial, owned residential, separated from residential. There's two vacant buildings on the site. I'm going to meet hell with these people now. I've had to come out. I hope the city had ordinance and stuff that would protect me. They know who's going to be telling the city to stop all what they're doing. And I'm not, I'm not a brave man. I can't protect myself against the likes of the people who already got, dare I say it, a tax abatement to do what they're doing for five years. They never mentioned acquiring residential property on the deep west side of Telegraph at their tax abatement approval hearing. So you were kind of tricked. But you haven't been tricked because that's what this tax abatement policy, I know, you're right to cut me off that tax abatement because, you know, I could go on all night. Nonetheless, I'm begging, I'm literally begging you to stop this encroachment on residential property by this commercial business. Again, Mr. Crowe, it's nothing personal. You bought into this three rings here.
everybody up here would agree to me, but what's happened to these few people that are left on Gardner Street is, is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of. I mean, that is just a, an embarrassment because they're getting just picked apart, you know, a little bit at a time. And there's nothing great about a chain link fence next to your property. I mean, that's, and this is still his home, and I think, what is it, two other homes? Yeah, they're west of that. I mean, these people are, you know, they might as well put a cage around them. I mean, I don't know, but next to all, did they tear out the trees and the bushes? No. They, all they did was rubbing in order to get the survey so they can identify where the fence is going to go. What's they, rubbing? They well, they're all out. They, they, they yeah. do chipping of the smaller trees. Yeah. We only identified two two actual trees along the entire frontage that were greater than eight inches. Um, and there's a permitting process for removing trees over eight inches. And we have to verify whether or not they were quality trees, dead trees, and they have a right to remove a minimum number of trees based on the total acreage. So they haven't violated any of our um, ordinances with regard to tree removal. They've been here a long time. They've been good to the community. Why would they put some kind of a landscaping? Uh, I mean, for the chair, between the neighbors, the residential, and and it's industrial. Or tell them to buy these three people out or something, and let them have peace. And this is going on and on and on and on. What Bradford School did to them, and all the trees that they cut down, and all the noise. I mean, both to to Green Dolphin. I mean, this thing has been a nightmare. Ever since they came around here. I agree. They, their intent is to keep the entire width of the lot as green buffer between their business yeah, and their business. they've got a chain made fence. A site that's coming out of my property. Our recommend, recommendation would be a black vinyl coated fence, and then they're going to let the the uh, green grow back in to act as a buffer. Their intent is to have that naturalize itself back into the woods that it is. They, all, they needed to clear a six foot wide area for surveying and to install the fencing. And then after that, they're going to allow it to go back to nature. And so the entire width of the lot, I don't have it off the top of my head, 50, 75 feet, will be a greenway bunker between their business and where Mr. Bunker is. Well, that's what, and I, I, that's that's what I've got doing in the media and the telegraph for bringing things back to nature. <laughs> you know, I mean, what is bringing it back to nature? I mean, you put a tree that how many years it going to take to grow? Oh, I mean, are they going to put mature trees in? Are they going to put mature bushes in? You know, I mean, I mean, I, I, I guess you, you kind of caught in between, but I mean, I just feel sorry for these people that that are there and left behind. I mean, it just either keep getting eaten away, you know, reach in. I mean, maybe they should be good business people and buy them all out. And, and do their own thing. They can you know, make uh, Bradford happy. Part, I mean, part, it's, it's getting ridiculous. I mean, it really is. Part, part of the, what the planning commission, I, again, I stated at the last meeting, there was four study sessions held, and the recommendation was to allow Max Pro to expand westward through Mr. Bunker's property and then create a freeway bumper, extend Church's Street into an L going west and a cul-de-sac, and relocate housing development to the back end of those lots and create a buffer between where the school and Gardner Street is and where new residential development could take place. A concept plan was proposed and it was given to the, the residents to consider further action. So, um, I, I, since I've been here, I know that um, the charter school has provided a lot of challenges for the city um, with traffic and other issues. We're sympathetic to the residents there. We've, we've tried to meet with them. Uh, Mr. Bumper can verify that we, my department has spoken with him and met with him on several occasions to try to come up with a solution, but ultimately we don't own the property. We're trying to make some amends um, through goodwill with the adjacent property owner. But, but really, I mean, what you're doing is, is, uh, is you know, making the property work. It's the most reverse uh, condemnation what they're doing. I mean, nobody would like to live in those conditions. I, I realize what you're up against, but I just think that I feel bad about the, what's happened to these people. I really do. And we look 
property other than putting a fence up and tearing down the vacant home right now. Their intent is to keep it as a greenway buffer. You said it's going, they're going to allow it to kind of come back to nature and you're going to let it go wild. But couldn't they, couldn't we? I'm certainly not going to let it go wild. More of a, more of a substantial plan. Yeah, plan. Get it but we can't require it. It's not, well, it's not maybe required. They would, um, but we can appeal to Have they declared a nature trip, um, excuse me, a walking path? Have they declared? 
declared that it's going to be a, a nature preserve? I mean, no. is it an official nature preserve? No. Or is it still it's residential? It's a three-way buffer that's residential. Still residential, residential buffer. Seems to me we ought to ask the control over what it looks like. <laughs> until, yeah. they, until they change the, na the nature of it. Right. So, uh, Mr. Bunker doesn't get up in the morning, look out, and he has to look through weeds in order to see the sun come up. Sure. So, I think we ought to do whatever we can to work with Nash Control to ease the pressure on the folks that are <laughs> living on Connor and Mr. Bunker seems to be getting the brunt of it because he's the first, first one. And again, and I might be missing something, but we don't get in the business of reviewing residential properties unless they're multiple family or some other development. And th they actually have the right to remove many trees if the permit is pulled with a replacement. So I'm, I'm, I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place about well, maybe we what, should enforcement, do enforcement. what enforcement, and I have notified and spoke with the head of the code enforcement about any observations and put them on notice of keep, keep an eye on the property. Yeah, I think this is a unique situation and doesn't seem to follow any of the rules that we've set up other than the fact that our, our position is to work with the residents and try to make the quality of life as best as we possibly can. So if it doesn't fit a template of what we've already established for business, residents, and all that, we need to think outside the box or outside the chain of fence or inside the chain of fence and, and uh, make it as, as pleasant as it possibly can for the people that are on guard. Because as, as uh, Mr. Prakashi says, they have been under pressure for the last several years right. with school and traffic and everything else. And that's adjacent to my, my uh, uh, neighborhood. So, right. and, and I can say that through this, we've also notified the Coast Department about the former newspaper building and maintaining that, about the, the abandoned parking lot and maintaining that. So we are, we are trying to address these issues as they're brought to our attention. Okay. Several of those positions. 
This city refuses to hire the cadet. Why? I can answer that. The city is trying to run public safety on the cheap. What's next on the agenda? Rent a cops? By using these foolish cost-saving methods, this city is jeopardizing your public safety. Remember, it was a public safety millage that passed in May of 2011. Five, give our police officers a contract now. The police officers have not had an acceptable contract since 2008, yet every day they risk their lives for us. Our police officers should not have to worry about their jobs, their bills, and their pensions. Remember, it was a public safety millage that passed in May of 2011. Voters, it is time for a change. Councilwoman Sylvia Jordan, as a former employee of the EEOC, you should understand fair contract talks better than most. If what you say is true that you value our police officers, urge your fellow council members to do the right thing and give our police officers a contract now. This council refuses to address the 800-pound gorilla in the room tonight. A community is only as strong as its public safety. What matters right now is the pressing issue of public safety. And I thought Ms. English was going to be here tonight. I believe that the information you, Ms. English, brought forward is very substantial and well vetted con concerning and regarding the acting chief, Brian Gerald, and his candidacy for the permanent position. Why is council delaying filling this position? The masses believe that Brian Gerald should be eliminated from the selection process. There appears to be problems with integrity and other issues like his candidacy without having a degree, time embezzlement, misuse of a company car, inappropriate use of city contracted vendors for personal use, unlawful surveillance of residents and other acting chiefs, and the list goes on. I'm concerned about how my police officers and other civil employees feel about his rampage and Chief Thomas's office and the whole bit. So I want to finish by saying I thought the millage was passed in May of 2011 and that it was for public safety. Maybe the millage was passed to balance the budget or for free cars, free trips, and free gas. It's time for a change. Voters, that's right. It's time for a change. Our next request is from Mr. Mr. Gerard Mullen. Perfect. Not even that jewel on South Hill Road, like the village, 
Although I've heard that late the past, terrific EMS and fire service. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Mr. Toby Rhodes. Mr. Rhodes here. Mr. Rhodes, please come to the lawyer. Thank you for having me on the phone. Hey, this is Toby Rhodes. Um, I live at 17001 in Jersey, um, Southfield, Michigan. Um, I've lived there since 1988. And I'm here to speak about the encounter that had with the Southfield Police. The city attorney's office supports the district court with regard to Bank of America. Um, one thing I want to say is that, from my personal experience over the past three years dealing with the Southfield Police, I can't say too much good about it. Um, one thing I have known is that the Southfield Police, from my personal experience, are very petty, very small minded, not interested in public safety, but more interested in their pensions, their paychecks, their free cars, their free gas. They're more interested in making sure that. Their safety is paramount, not the safety of the public. And I say this from my experiences with trying to inform my community about the dangers and the threat of Bank of America. Bank of America, of course, is a subprime bank, a bailout bank, a predator bank. It's a bank that is not from Michigan. It doesn't care at all about the interests of uh, the people of Michigan or the people of Southfield. Its only interest is short term profit. They don't sell out our homes, they'll sell out our families, they'll sell out our futures for that short term profit because that has no tie to Michigan, it has no, no concern whatsoever. And I'm no fan of, of uh, banks that are from outside of Michigan. Local, local banking is the only way that you can have a community thrive and be successful. And I think Michigan is a great example of that. When the local banks uh, disappear, like NBD and Standard Federal and uh, Comerica and the left, the economy started to suffer. And there's a specific reason for that. When you make loans, you have to under understand the community. You must have an intimate relationship with the community to be able to allocate the resources appropriately so they go into the people to the most productive purposes and resources. I mean, um, uh, projects. But when you have a, 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 an outside bank like Bank of America, their only purpose is to extract as much wealth from the local communities that they can. They do this all over the country, and people complain about it all over the country, which is why you have movements like Occupy, and which is why you have um, uh, lawsuits all over the country. Because Bank of America is a threat. I don't know why anyone would, would want Bank of America or any bailout bank, predator bank, subprime bank, failure bank, or bank in their community. It serves no productive purpose for that local community. Instead of protecting the interests of or the rights of those who live in the community, we have the lawful right to exercise the constitutional, constitutionally recognized free speech protection. Some of the police instead attacked me. They didn't say that, well, you have the right to do this. They said, well, Bank of America's profits are paramount, and we're going to attack you, someone who's lived in the community for decades, to protect those profits. And I've had to deal with their constant lies and their constant false accusations that have been backed up by the city attorney's office and backed up by specific judges in the 46th District Court. I can't say they're all bad. Uh, well, let me say like this. One retired after my after my trial, one action was pretty good. And I, I said that was Sheila Johnson. She she fought me in the beginning, but at the end, when it came down to it, she did the right thing. But this one judge, a widow bench, so I say, just really doesn't belong on the bench. Because what you find is that the interest is not in protecting the rights of the community. The interest is maintaining the status quo. And that's one thing that the, is the purpose of the police. The police are not here to protect you. Court rulings have shown that. The, the police have absolutely no obligation, no any responsibility, nor duty to protect the public. And there's a very simple reason for that, because if they did, then you could sue them if, if you weren't protected. So to prevent them from having that liability, the police have absolutely no, no obligation or duty to protect you. So why are you paying for them? You pay for them to maintain an order. And who decides that order? Well, the police decide that order. And the police decide that Bank of America are paramount in your community and you're secondary, well, then there's nothing you can do about it except to try to complain, stand up, and try to um, uh, 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 exercise your rights in the court. But all of that is time-consuming and very expensive. And it takes uh, a lot, great deal of effort. And if you're not able to do that, they get away with that. So you're basically paying for nothing. You're not getting the honest services for which you pay. And that's what I've seen with the Southfield Police. And I find it interesting that every time I have an encounter, when I want to complain
Council, I'd like to ask uh, if we could move up administration since this might be easier to take care of that body for the next meeting. We'll come back to the council mayor portion. Um, Mr. Storm, I mean, I'll take this for uh, owners. Oh, go ahead, Mr. Storm. Sure. Please. Um, we have an opportunity uh, to save money without affecting services to our taxpayers. Uh, that's what this boils down to, uh, this proposal. Uh, it also reflects and uh, is right on target to our uh, budget message, which is unity of spirit of uh, purpose. Uh, our outside service providers, our city treasurer, finance committee, uh, all uh, weighed in on this, uh, and uh, there's been a lot of homework uh, done. In fact, I would describe my own review of this in terms of how many questions I ask is, is uh, put it nicely painful, uh, because uh, we are risk averse when it comes to our taxpayer dollars, and uh, this is a newer method of uh, refinancing or uh, re refunding the bonds that we have used before. Uh, however, it is totally, completely appropriate, uh, appropriate to our particular situation uh, and uh, the interest uh, rate environment. Uh, we have a bond issue uh, for the uh, fire station four, which is on 12 mile and uh, that was uh, originated uh, in 2003. Uh, it was also for the uh, renovation of the former library uh, space. Uh, we have an opportunity to refinance that uh, because of the interest rates to refinance that bond issue at a substantial savings, uh, estimated at $250,000 over the uh, life of the remaining 11 years that are left on the uh, bond. Schedule. Uh, there is no risk involved in this at all uh, for the city. Uh, that was my main concern. Uh, and uh, it is through a private placement uh, and a competitive uh, placement with uh, uh, banks or the, uh, financial, appropriate financial institutions. Rather than going through the normal uh, uh, procedure, which requires a uh, much more, uh, uh, it requires an official statement and also bond ratings and they are not required under this process. In order to qualify, uh, the, the municipality must issue less than uh, an aggregate of $10 million of debt within a year. Uh, we meet that uh, criteria and uh, uh, this has been, uh, again, uh, a six month effort uh, I want to uh, commend the financial advisor, Carrie Blanchett, who uh, basically brought this to our attention. She monitors our uh, outstanding debt for these opportunities. Uh, and uh, City Treasurer Lohenberg worked on this also. And uh, uh, Bob Council uh, Michael McGee. Uh, I'm real comfortable with it to recommend that the experts are here. Uh, Mr. McGee is here. Uh, Ms. Blanchett is here, <coughs> and uh, City Treasurer is here as well. And so, so, by way of introduction, that's that's what's involved, and uh, I wholeheartedly uh, recommend it. Madam Chair, Mr. I've this came before the Finance Committee, and uh, I also like to thank Terry and her uh, <coughs> for bringing this forward, and, and also the work that you've done. With and all these guys. Over the weekend, I understand you got called a bunch of times. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, I, it's, it's one of these things that you look at, and, you, you know, at least I was looking at it, and I think it's for real because it's, it's something different. It's not selling a bond, it's refinancing uh, a bond. It's saving the city some $250,000 and $200,000. Um, Boy, if that is a need for the city, every dollar that we can get is uh, it's going to be beneficial to us in the long run. So, uh, uh, after many exhaustive conversations, uh, I have the same opinion that Mr. Charette has that, uh, that I think the risks are well or done, and, uh, and I think we should go forward with this. Uh, if you want to say something sitting there, if you don't want to say anything, if you don't want to say anything, I, I will make a motion. Well, I'll make a motion that we approve 
the background is also uh, very active with the proposed refinancing of these bonds. These bonds will uh, take the interest rate. Right now, we're looking at a 4.21% interest rate uh, that, that we're going to be paying for these uh, remaining term previously. We'll take it down to an estimated uh, 2.1. We're taking that to practically half of the interest rate that we would have to pay. So it's a substantial savings for the city, and uh, we appreciate the council finance uh, spending the time to review this with us, and uh, Carrie and uh, Mike McGee for uh, the efforts that they put in as well. Thank you, Mr. Romer, and I'd like to thank Mr. McKee and Ms. Blanchett also. I was at at least one of the meetings that uh, was just discussed and substituted for compliments. It wasn't there. We have a motion by Mr. Bacassi, supported by Mr. Seiler. Is that correct? Yes. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Now all set. Thank you for having us Thank you very much. Thank you for staying. And thank you for staying.